Hello and welcome to CS350 Online, episode number eight. I'm your host as always, Leslie Eistand. Now let's get right into things today with the OS of the day. If you haven't guessed, today's operating system of the day is going to be Unix. Now, I could sit here and I could tell you all about Unix. I could tell you that it was created back in the late 60s, early 70s at Bell Labs. I could tell you that uh, Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson were amongst the primary developers, amongst other individuals like Kernahan who were involved with documentation and application development. But you know what? I, I mean, I could tell you Unix was like a successor to Maltics. But why am I telling you about Unix? So why don't we let someone tell us about Unix who is actually there for the development of Unix at Bell Labs. So as many of you may have noted, I kept asking you to post questions that you would hypothetically ask to one of the original Unix developers uh, on Piazza. And it wasn't just some kind of hypothetical question out of boredom, participation, all that nonsense. I actually reached out to someone who was at Bell Labs during the creation of Unix, uh, an amazing researcher whose name is quite legendary amongst those in computer science. And I had an opportunity to ask him your questions. And we recorded his this interview we had with him, um, I think it was almost 10, 10 days ago or so. And uh, this is just for this online version of CS350. So it is my great pleasure to introduce to all of you the author of many, many books, such as The Go Programming Language, Practice of Programming, The Awk Programming Language, and we also, of course, can't forget the Unix programming environment. Um, probably the most notable book this individual has worked on, the C programming language. He is the K in KNR. It is with my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Brian Kernhan. Contact. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? Great. <laughs> Yourself? Yeah, I'm doing fine. Uh, let me uh, become real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess the, the, the background is sort of uh, <laughs> the dream. <laughs> My wife and I had, have, have gone to England a number of times over the last few years, and we usually take the boat. And this I took out of the boat front window last year, and this year's visit obviously <laughs> fell apart <laughs> for reasons that we all know describing your yeah. role in the creation of the unix operating system yeah i mean an accurate statement is um present at the creation but not responsible for any of it because <laughs> i was in the same group as uh ken thompson and dennis ritchie uh and this was back i had spent the summer of 67 and the summer of 68 there and at Bell Labs in Murray Hill. And I got to know Ken and Dennis and the, I had spent the summer of 66 at uh, MIT working on uh, Multics operation. In fact, just sort of an initial virtual connection with the people at Bell Labs. I didn't meet them physically until a year later. Um, so I was there in the same group, but I wasn't doing anything related to operating systems or anything like that. Um, and so this was entirely Ken Thompson uh, Dennis Ritchie's building it, but I was one of the very, very early users of the system. I don't even remember what I used it for at that point because it was running on a tiny machine. It, uh, in some arguable sense, it didn't do a lot, but I, um, I was one of the very early users, sufficiently early that um, I had a single-digit user ID 
on the original Linux system, that was ID9. Okay. And so this is an exceptionally select group uh, <clears throat> because, of course, things like zero were the root and one was this and that. So there were really only six or seven single digit IDs. I got the last one. But nothing to do with the creation of it. Just a happy user for, for many, many years. And obviously, I, over time, I contributed various kinds of application software and, and documentation and so on, but not the core operating system. Mm -hmm. So since you've known uh, Thompson and Richie for so many years, do you know what some of their motivation behind the creation of Unix was? Yeah, I think it was always to produce a system that was you know, productive for programming. And that was Ken's purpose for sure, something he liked to explore ideas in computers and you know, programs in general uh, over a whole spectrum of activities ranging from the operating system itself through languages, through uh, applications in all kinds of weird areas. Um, and Dennis, I think, came along with exactly the same, but as well had this notion of um, creating a community, something where people could actually work together. And that's something that he said explicitly on a number of occasions that the purpose of Unix. And I don't know where that was looking back after a few years, but it certainly worked out that way, that it was creating a community of people uh, as opposed to just, you know, something where you wrote programs. And, and certainly in the early years, uh, that worked astonishingly well. So, so Sharon is asking, uh, what do you believe are the design principles or aspects that has made Unix so prevalent today, or so influential today? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. And thank you, Sharon. Um, it seems to me that, it, and of course, obviously, this is hindsight. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> the wisdom of looking backwards. I, but I think a lot of it was finding general mechanisms that applied across a collection of things that might have been thought separate in earlier times. Um, and some of it was finding a decent level of abstraction for things so that you didn't have irrelevancy bubbling up too high in the programming stack, let's call it. The obvious one to me is the file system, which at the time, and it's hard to believe now, but at the time file systems it was hard even to call them file systems in some sense because what they basically did was to take all of the weird parameters that would characterize things like physical disks, you know, the number of sectors and the number of the tracks and all kinds of bizarre stuff and propagate that up so that you couldn't do anything with those devices unless you knew all of those facts. And then of course, if you had to change anything like you got a different disk or, or something like that, you had to change the way you approached it. And, and the high point of this was IBM's job control language, JCL, um, which was just inscrutable and unusable. And so one thing that, that Unix did was to find that very nice layer, the file system abstraction was very, very clean uh, access to secondary storage, but other things uh, as well, integrating at the time, integrating the devices of the machine into uh, the file system as well as the, you know, the, the disk in its hierarchical file system sense. Uh, that was a new idea. And so I think those are the kinds of things that made it propagate. Um, others were writing in high level language, not an original idea, but carried through particularly well uh, in, uh, in Unix. Uh, and C was a very, very, very nice match of what machines could do with what people could do. So it's kind of a sweet spot in expressiveness and efficiency, which were, in particular, efficiency was extremely important. It's hard for people to understand now, but just how wimpy computers were, <laughs> what, what I would call the good old days, um, where if you were lucky, your machine might have tens of thousands of bytes, tens of thousands of kilobytes, not gigabytes uh, of storage. So all of those things, I think, helped to um, in some sense, make it right. Simplification, finding the right generalizations, mechanisms that weren't too complicated, sort of the right mix of stuff. So that's my sense, anyway. Yeah, we actually do a whole unit about file systems. <laughs> yeah. But one of the things you may have noticed, um, the Plan 9 operating system, which did not succeed in the same way that Unix did, but one of the things that Plan 9 did was to try and take that idea that file system is a natural interface to lots of things and apply it 
much more broadly. You find all kinds of other things within an operating system that could be thought of as hierarchical file system like things. So processes become hierarchical. The control that you might apply to a process becomes part of a file system. Um, shell environment variables, that's just a file system, which where the files are the environment variables, um, windows themselves, uh, network connections. So all kinds of things fit under that. You know, and then that means the same code at the user level can be used to manipulate all of this, which is kind of neat. Uh, Mohammed, who is asking, knowing how influential Unix has been today, is there anything you think people would go back and time to change about it? <laughs> I'm sure there are. You know, Ken Thompson has been asked that question, and I will let him speak. Uh, well, I will speak for him because he's not here to defend himself. But somebody asked him that question. If there's one single thing that you would do to, to if you were doing Unix over again, he said, I would spell create with a E. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's a frivolous answer. I think there there are probably more uh, serious answers as well. Um, I honestly don't know, and this, and this comes my my defense is that since I didn't have anything to do with the operating system, uh, it's, it's not my fault. Um, and I think I got it wrong. Um, I suspect parts of what might be done differently. It's hard to say. You have to again remember that things were incredibly small. I mean, the PDP 11s tended to have something like 32K bytes to memory, maybe 64K bytes if you were lucky. The secondary storage, the disks, had you know, single digit megabytes of storage at most. And so you didn't have a lot of room for maneuvering. And that meant that mechanisms had to be simple. Um, and some of those mechanisms have probably not stood the test of time as well as they could. For example, a lot of security issues today are, um, it's kind of too bad because in olden times, this was a totally open environment, remember the community. Um, and so you assumed that you were working in a group of people all who trusted each other completely and there was no problem and that we didn't need more complicated security and privacy mechanisms than we have. And of course, that's completely unrelated to the world today, especially when the mission is on the internet uh, with billions of other people assaulting you all the time. So some of those are decisions that maybe could would be different today, but you have to go back and put yourself in the time to you have the resources and even the understanding of what the future might be at that particular time. We have another Mohammed, a different one, <laughs> is, uh, asking about how, I mean, the world labels Unix as one of the most important operating systems that's ever been developed. Um, and as one of the people who's been involved with it, whether as a developer or one of the earliest users, um, are you happy with um, how things have played out? Are you surprised at how it's what's become of it <laughs> yeah that's an easier one the answer is yes absolutely um because i'm i'm absolutely certain that nobody at the time thought that this was going to in some sense keep going would still be around at this point what 50 years later um or anything like that that it would be pervasive either in sort of derivative direct derivative original form or um, at this point numerically much more in the, the linux flavor um, so I don't think anybody predicted that. I remember seeing an advertisement, a classified advertisement in the newspaper when there were newspapers and they had classified advertisements at one point looking for Unix programmers. And <laughs> they sent it to Ken and Dennis saying, we've arrived. Um, this was probably back in the, geez, I don't know, mid, late 70s or something like that. So no, I don't think any, uh, any reasonable uh, prediction of what might have happened what is it, you know, ideal what has happened? I think, oh, on balance, obviously, this is a good thing. Uh, Unix and Linux have become essentially commodities. Everybody uses them. Everybody can count on a pretty uniform environment. You can write programs for one of them. And <clears throat> with high probability, they'll work pretty much the same on all of them. And so you remove a whole bunch of pointless variation, and that's good. I think the thing that I wonder about is the 
uh, continuing growth and complexity of all of the various pieces. And I don't know whether that's whether there's a way to control that in some sense. Um, some of the complexity is maybe necessary because there's lots more gadgets to deal with. There's lots more things you have to worry about, the aforementioned security and privacy kinds of things. Um, but at the same time, a lot of stuff seems pretty complicated, much more so than it needs to be. And it seems like there's, maybe it's time for somebody to have another bright idea of how to strip away all of the junk and, and uh, come back to something that's smaller and cleaner uh, than what we have. I don't know about the inside of the operating system. I long since stopped looking at that, but I look at application level software and there's just a boatload of it. And I don't think we'll need as much as we've got. Uh, a lot of it is, uh, somebody has a bright idea, they write a program, it becomes part of something, uh, but nothing cleans it up afterwards. Nima is asking uh, how did or who came up with the idea of piping outputs to inputs in Unix? You know, that is, that's one of those things which um, is pretty, I guess I'd say reasonably well understood or documented at this point. It was some combination of Doug McElroy, who was um, calling a manager is kind of an insult. He was just absolutely fabulous guy in every respect. Uh, had for a long time been taking, had the idea that you should be able to, to uh, connect programs. And he talked about screwing together sections of garden hose. Um, as a metaphor for what you wanted to do. And at some point, um, Ken Thompson came up with a mechanism for doing it with a lousy syntax, and then shortly thereafter came up with the current syntax, the pipe mechanism. And that was just a revelation. And that literally took place probably in 24 hours or something. But um, people said, wow, you can actually do things like this and we and people went back and started uh, inventing pipelines of things that you could do and also modifying programs so that they would read input from standard uh, input and write to standard output so that they could be put into pipelines even if it didn't make sense like sort for example which has to read all its input before it produces any of its output was still packaged so that you could put it in a pipeline you didn't have to think about the fact that it was cherishing up all the input before it produced any output and so that was all done in a very, very short period of time, and I'm not sure the exact date. Um, we will pause for a brief commercial announcement. Um, this, <laughs> I can't, I can't figure out my example. Um, one of the things I did last summer, in fact, part of this book was written on that boat, um, was this Unix uh, history that um, I spent most of the summer and the fall working on. And in there are things like the description of the uh, invention of the pipes and sort of background as insofar as people at this point can remember it accurately. Uh, but I definitely remember it as one of those things where there was just a frenzy of inventions. People said, wow, never thought of this. Let me show you what you can do by connecting two programs together. Um, if you look in the actual operating system, I don't know whether part of your course involves taking a quick look at the sixth edition code, which is uh, small, much smaller than your whatever it is, OS one sixty one, and look at that and just look the implementation of the pipe system calls. You know, geez, I got twenty lines code or something like that. It's just tiny. Hmm. Um, and you so, said that was uh, system six. Sixth edition, yeah. Sixth edition, that's, okay. That's the one that shows up in John Lyon's commentary on uh, Unix, uh, Unix operating system. Um, and that's the point when the system was probably maximum functionality and minimum size in, in some sense. I mean, the whole thing is just over 9,000 lines of code. Oh, wow. <laughs> and obviously, it doesn't do certain things. There was no networking at that point. Um, and it, uh, wasn't doing paging or virtual memory of any sort. It was doing swapping, but, but nothing more complicated than that. Um, and the memory was small enough that you could get by with basically linear algorithms for pretty much everything. But it meant that the code was really easy to understand. And then this um, commentary that John Lyons wrote was basically line by line. On, on one side is the code, and the other side is the explanation of what is this code doing. And it's just an absolutely marvelous uh, thing to read. Huh. Yeah, that's actually something I, I think I'll probably look for that because I think that would be uh, something fun to uh, to look through. And 9,000 lines is much smaller than OS 161. Uh, yes. 
which is the toy os that we're using for for our course for the moment <laughs> right yeah i think um i think you might find it intriguing as i say there's there's stuff that isn't there but uh, the core of how it how it works is worthwhile and i don't know somewhere in this book i, I highly recommend buying this book this book is great <laughs> Uh, somewhere in here is a description of the, uh, John Lyon's book, but I can't find it right now, so we won't worry about it. Um, <laughs> the book is available on Amazon. End of commercial announcement. My apologies. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Zora Ver uh, is curious to know what the most important lessons um, you learned from being a part of these early Unix days. <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> I would guess that one of them is, is one of those lessons where you have no control over it in some sense, <clears throat> but it is always really good to work with incredibly good people. Um, <laughs> so the question is, how do you get to that point? Well, it helps to be lucky in some sense. And then when you're there to take the best advantage you can of that. And so I was at Bell Labs and I went there, as I said, in a summer, couple of summer internship co-op-y type things in, uh, 67 and 68 and then I went there permanently in 69 and uh, by the luck of a draw I was in this group of astonishing people who uh, also changed the world with what they were doing and so that was pure luck um, and I guess when you're in that kind of thing you're forced to play your game as best you can because uh, you're playing up all the time they're all better than you are um, and so that's part of it. The other thing is to find some piece of it where you can contribute in a way that others can't or won't or something like that. And I think in my particular case, it was um, writing. Most of the group didn't care much to write anything. Um, Dennis Ritchie was the exception, I would say. But most of the folks there didn't do a lot of writing. Whereas I, for whatever reason, uh, didn't find it a problem, kind of enjoyed it and got better at it over time. Um, and so that was, in some sense, my contribution in a lot of ways to the whole operation was just being one of the people who were willing to write things down, trying to explain how they were used to other people, uh, why it was useful and important or something like that. So if you can find that kind of niche for yourself, it's probably uh, a good thing. One of the people that I hung out with at Bell Labs was a guy named Dick Hamming. You've probably heard of Hamming Codes. Yep. <laughs> Your students should have too. Um, uh, but I was in um, at Bell Labs in the office next door to Dick Hammond for some years. Um, and that was very, very useful. He was a mentor in a lot of ways. And he was one of these guys who was always trying to figure out what can I do that in some sense I could do better, you know, how to make the most of what resources he had. And he would say that he wasn't the brightest guy in the world, but he worked hard with a lot of people and in a sensible way, and therefore over a lifetime, you can accomplish more than a lot of people did. Um, he gave a really, really nice talk back in the mid 80s called You and Your Research. And you can find it, you can find the transcript of the original version of it. Um, and then you can find places where he reprised it, uh, even on video over the next few years. Um, it's a really nice example of how to kind of have a career in some sense, and there's lots and lots of good advice. And not everybody would agree with every part of it or anything like that, but I find it useful. And I've been aiming my students at it now for some years to just say, OK, you know, here's some career planning advice. Mm -hmm. You can't plan your career really. But what you can do is, uh, when you get a, a shot at something, make the most of it. Or, uh, who was it, Pasteur, who said, chance favors the prepared mind. OK, so you can make some of your own luck by um, kind of being in the right place or when something comes along, grab at it. Um, or when you've got a choice, make the choice that's more likely to do something. Or maybe just work a little harder than somebody else does. If you work an extra, I don't know, 10% harder than your friends. And this is obviously <laughs> a hypothetical at the moment. <laughs> but if you work 10% harder than, than your colleagues, um, then, you know, You've got twice as much in seven years. That's the doubling time. And so, um, you know, over a lifetime, that can give you a leg up to do whatever you want to do. And that could be money or fame or just a nicer life or more choices of what you do subsequently, all kinds of stuff. So it's useful. 
useful um, thing to look at. Highly recommend it. Pontificating. Ildar and Victor are asking um, what you think some of the underrated features of Unix are, and if you think there is a Unix's greatest failure. <laughs> Wait, oh. You know that that's got to be a good question. It doesn't trigger an obvious and <laughs> facile answer. Yeah. <laughs> What's an underrated feature of Unix? Oh, geez. I don't. Maybe it's underrated today in a way that it wasn't earlier. Um, and that is the idea of being of building things out of pieces, in particular um, separate commands, rather than building <clears throat> big monolithic things. Um, building them out of smaller pieces so that you can um, a not have to write so much code, uh, and b if you've got a complicated process, you can instantiate the various components of it. Um, I think of this in terms of something like exploratory data analysis, where you've got something, you've got a big file of some kind of data, maybe it's logs from something, maybe it's a CSV a spreadsheet, whatever. And you're trying to figure out what on earth is in that. Um, and I find it easiest to go and kind of look at that in small pieces and try and figure out what's going on, do summary things like counting, adding up, looking for anomalies, things like that, and gradually figure out what kind of process I want to do to it. And to do that well, I use these, well, and this is where the, maybe it's underrated, maybe it isn't, uh, existing small tools that go along with, you know, and, you know I think of lock for obvious reasons, but, um, you know, stuff like graph or word count, and sort, and so on, all these things that let you do simple manipulation and largely on text. Um, and then at some point, maybe I figured out what I want to do. And then maybe at that point, I would go say, OK, write a real program in a real programming language that encapsulates all of it. Um, and I, that's the way I would approach some of these things. I think a lot of people approach them instead by saying, well, let me whip out, pick your favorite language, probably Python at this point, and, and start writing Python code to do that same sort of thing but in a ball of wax that's a single thing rather than these separate pieces. Um, or maybe they will fire up a you know, Jupyter notebook at this point, maybe that's the way that people do exploratory data analysis. And that has a different set of trade-offs. Um, yeah. Because it's harder to see the, 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 the things that happen in between the steps in some ways in you know, the notebook. Um, and you're also somewhat limited by the size of the, just the screen you're dealing with. I, it's an arm waving uh, kind of answer to a, actually quite a neat question. Uh, but I, you know, I kind of think of this as, you know, sometimes the old ways are best. So think of these simple uh, little things, at least while you're trying to figure out what's going on in something. And once you understand it completely, by all means, write whatever program you want. Natasha is asking what advice you would give to modern day CS students we're wishing to leave a legacy behind them like yourself and your friends. <laughs> I'm not dead yet. There's no legacy. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, well, I don't know. Um, what I mentioned with, with Dick Hamming and so on would be part of the answer to that. Um, I think that, um, as I say, he tried to make the most of what he had. One of the things that he said that um, I didn't mention earlier is the idea of if you want to um, make a real contribution, then you should work on important problems. And the way he described it, he used to eat uh, in the cafeteria at Bell Labs, you know, big building, lots of people eat in the cafeteria. And he used to eat with people from chemistry, even though he wasn't a chemist, he would eat with people with chemistry. And he would ask them at lunch, uh, basically, and often literally, so what are you working on that might win you a Nobel Prize? And they would say, oh, we're not doing anything with winning Nobel Prize. And he said, well, in that case, why are you working on it? It can't be important. Not that you would get the Nobel Prize necessarily, but it, the problem you're supposed to be working on might be something that would have that kind of significance. Um, so work on important stuff. And so what does that mean? For a modern computer scientist, uh, 
if you go work at, pick your favorite big company, a fang tech company, or Facebook or Microsoft, or Google or whatever, you do not want to spend the first two years of your time there deciding what color to make the submit button or whatever, right? And yet a lot of the jobs there, I'm being cynical, but they have that flavor that they're just down in the noise. Who could care less? Um, and so trying to find something where if you did discover something that would actually make a difference um, working on important problems or problems that are likely to be relevant to a lot of people, or at least working on things that appeal to you personally for some reason, that, that, because you'll work harder on them or work more effectively or better. Um, uh, so that that's kind of what I would <laughs> suggest. Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, an awful lot of this is, is the pure luck aspect of things. But if you put yourself in situations where you are more likely to work on something important or relevant, or you work with people who are more likely to do that kind of thing, the better odds you are. Um, another thing is to simply make yourself visible. Um, people who can present themselves reasonably well in various kinds of settings will do better than the ones who go into their office and close the door, or, well, you can't do that in the modern world. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, put some helmet on in your cubicle. Um, but, and that's things like learning to write well, which we talked about uh, earlier, but also learning how to speak well, and in particular, being able to talk to people who are not in your community. Yes. Can you explain what you're doing to somebody who is not a computer scientist, to somebody who's, a, you know, I don't know, an art historian or something? and find ways to um, find common ground, for example. So all of these are, are ways in which I think you are more likely to uh, have more of an effect on something. But another thing that Hamming also said is that most people will never make a difference to the world because the world can't stand that many shocks. <laughs> uh, Linda asks uh, what your opinion on this CS field in general is, and where do you think it's going to be heading in the future? <laughs> yeah, uh, these are good questions, by the way. You've done well with these folks. Um, so where's CS going in uh, the future? I actually don't know. I can see a couple of directions. One is what you would call core CS, the kind of stuff that's looking inward at the field. You're, you're teaching course operating systems, um, and there's a lot of really, really solid stuff that that water loop does an excellent job on. Kind of thing, core computer science, like the things that you need to make the stuff work. And so it's languages, compilers, operating system, networking, you name it. Um, and so that's a big piece of it. But I suspect that for most people, um, CS is looking outward in various ways, applications of one sort or another. And some of the, the obvious ones, you know, computing, let's call it engineering fields, one kind or another, some of it is. Um, Finance, that's a big deal in Princeton. Uh, I'm not sure that's useful for mankind, but okay. Uh, and increasingly, what I personally am playing with here has nothing to do with any of the above. And this, this is now special pleading. This is not, this is definitely not a way to make a buck. Um, but I'm playing with um, digital humanities, which is applying computers in uh, the humanities, um, social sciences, but especially humanities. Um, and it's not me personally so much, it's, it's my students going off and can find the interesting things that are the application of computing in traditional humanities disciplines, uh, like history uh, and literature, and that kind of thing. So. Um, I think that's kind of an open-ended area, and there's all sorts of intriguing things to work on there. Um, and you know, you're not likely to get as rich as Mark Zuckerberg or something like that <laughs> doing that. Um, but you might have a lot of fun, and you meet some really, really interesting people who will do who do different things with their lives and are turned on by different things, and, and sometimes there's common ground with that. So, so I. Now, is that computer science as a whole? I don't know, but I think that application of computing is going to be a big part of it. Um, and whether that means computer science splits off into different disciplines, like data science and computer science and who knows what else, um, that could happen, that sort of uh, fragmentation. In the same way that early departments in various universities were electrical engineering or something else, and then it became plus computer science, and then they split 
in some ways. Uh, or Wong Lu, I guess, which has computer science and computer science and math and, and who knows what other disciplines, all of those kinds of things. Mm. So Patricia asks what your favorite modern operating system is and why. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Uh, you know, it's actually it's sort of hard to back to, to something I, I hinted at earlier. I mean, it's Unix in its various flavors, and I actually don't feel strongly about which one it is. Um, I am at the moment sitting on a Mac, and that has a Unix-like thing hiding behind it, and I mostly use the Mac, uh, aside things like Zoom, uh, as, you know, terminals. And so I'm sitting here running VI in standard terminal windows. Um, or I'm using it to SSH to Linux machines that are maintained by the computer science department here, um, or occasionally other places that are running. So essentially everything I do is running on some Unix-like system. And I think the thing that makes me grumpiest is when something that works on one of those doesn't work on the others, and I think it should. Um, and for the most part, I think things should work the same way on all of them. Um, so, so yeah, that's my favorite operating system. What else? <laughs> Heoran asks, what would you like to have for lunch today? <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> that it is an absolutely fair question. You know, it, it's one of these things where um, I suspect we're in the same pickle you are. You're basically stuck at home. Um, and so one of the things that would be fun to have for lunch is something that you can't get. Um, <laughs> at home and i don't know what that would be i mean in ancient times it might have been gee i would like to go get a big mac or something like that no that's not today's version of it but i could imagine you know the local brew pub and wouldn't it be fun to go over there and and, and sit with friends and have beer and one of their burgers or something like that so yeah that's what i wouldn't mind doing for lunch and it'd be the combination less of the food and more of the friends in some sense but sadly uh, Doing that virtually isn't quite the same. No. <laughs> we had a virtual wing night with our friends a few weeks ago. <laughs> My wife and I actually, we got curbside delivery from Walmart or something like that a few days ago. We're coming up on a wedding anniversary and we decided we would get a, a couple of quarts of ice cream, which is something that otherwise you're not going to have. Went in and again, I'm not terribly good at pronouncing many names. <laughs> um, so I apologize to Wendon if I've mispronounced his name or her name. Uh, if you could come back and do your undergrad over again, they would like to know if you would like to study at the MIT of the North, i.e. University of Waterloo. <laughs> <laughs> MIT North is the nickname. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. I was an undergrad at, at the University of Toronto uh, between 60 and 64. And at that point, I think Waterloo didn't quite exist. It's right on the hairy edge of when the Waterloo came along. Um, and since I had grown up in Toronto, um, although we were at that point living fast in Milton, um, uh, and my father went to Toronto, and, you know, they, so there was no ambiguity about it. it's going to be Toronto. Um, <laughs> If Waterloo had been an option, I might have thought of it. Queens might have been an option at the time because at the end, still does have a nice engineering program as well. Um, but I went on the basis of a recommendation from a high school math teacher. I went to engineering physics at the University of Toronto, um, but shortly thereafter, we named engineering science. Um, and that was one of those catch all courses for people who didn't know what they wanted to do. <laughs> And it was these baptism of fire kinds of things where uh, they just, oh, it was like a terrifying boot camp and they just put you through absolutely everything and there was, the survivors bonded pretty well. Um, and I think that's the hardest I've ever worked academically by miles. Um, and uh, I guess in that sense, it would be a good experience and I learned all kinds of stuff, some of which quite was quite practical because there were engineering things in it. You know, you learned why I-beams are shaped the way they are and what happens when you bend them too much anyway and stuff like that. But, <laughs> but also lots and lots of good mathematics and the physics and chemistry and, and so on. So it was actually quite a solid thing. I think one of the things that Waterloo offered probably right very early on was the co-op program, which yeah. meant that you got a chance to 
not only learn the stuff in school, but then to see what was relevant or not and, and complement it um, by going out and working in the real world. And I think that's something that I would have actually uh, gotten a lot out of because uh, many of my summer jobs are kind of pretty random um, by comparison with the, I think of more organized and probably uh, better done co-op experiences that you get at Waterloo. Mm -hmm. uh, so Mark asks, uh, if there's any open source projects that you are excited about today. <laughs> the short answer is no. It's not that there aren't good open source projects, but uh, I got stuff of my own that I'm kind of more interested in. And um, I think if I found an open source project that was something I was intrigued by and thought I could contribute, that would be great. <clears throat> But there's none that are right on the top of the stack at this point. And I guess part of it, there's a an issue with any of these open source, sorry, many open source projects that um, when you find out about them, they're often too big already. And the people who've been in them for a long time um, are so far ahead that it's not made clear that you could in any way do anything useful. Um, I mean, Linux Excel is the far end of that spectrum. I mean, there's no way that some random person can come along and do something useful uh, with that. Um, and probably similar for the various compilers and so on. So you'd have to pick something that was quite a bit smaller. Um, and at that point, then you're getting down into the noise of idiosyncratic things. You know, somebody had a bright idea and they spent an afternoon and they put it on GitHub and they made it open source and, you know, and there's probably what, a million of those or something like that. Um, so I think probably, I don't, well, definitely, I don't have anything at this point. Um, it would be nice actually to have, I've seen these occasionally, but not very recently, uh, a list, a decently curated list of, here are open source projects which are kind of of the right size and type that somebody interested but not expert could be usefully involved. I see things like that occasionally on Hacker News, but I don't, uh, I couldn't point to one right now. Do you have any uh, parting words of wisdom <laughs> for a group of CS students? I, I, yeah, it's hard to, to um, <clears throat> well, as you notice, I can shoot off my mouth, but whether it's worth saying anything is hard to say. I, but, you know, you're in a good field and you're in a great place. And so you should make the most of that kind of thing and explore as many different things as you can. Um, take an open mind to what's interesting and fun to work on. I mean, the stuff I mentioned on digital humanities, if you'd asked me 10 years ago whether that made sense, I would have said, oh, maybe, but I wouldn't have done anything. But then some combination of being a little bit more open-minded myself, encountering some people who are doing this, who are not computer people, um, gee, discovered that this is fun. So I think you know, kind of keep your eyes open for opportunities and when in doubt say yes instead of no. That's why we're talking. Yep. <laughs> Saying yes is why I am where I am today. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for talking to us today. <laughs> All right, so that was a very special interview and uh, I hope that it was interesting for you and I hope that some of the advice that he gave to us uh, strikes home and helps you with your future. So we give a big thank you uh, to Dr. Kernahan uh, for telling us about Unix and his experiences and his advice. And just if you're curious here, uh, let me show you some of the operating systems that uh, Unix has influenced over the years. So here is, and this chart is really incomplete, but what you'll see here is we've got Unix back here, and then it's got, you've got BSD, You've got Solaris and SunOS, AIX, Xenix. Uh, we've got HPUX, Next Step, which of course this is the one that many of you uh, will be familiar with uh, because Next Step 
becomes Mac OS X server becomes Mac OS X. So Unix is in most of our daily lives. And to the individual asking if the stream is going to be recorded and uploaded, of course, we always upload uh, the Twitch stream to YouTube right afterward. It usually takes about an hour for YouTube to take the video because it's about three and a half gigs. And then once a week, we're uploading lower quality versions to learn. So no worries if you mi missed the interview. There will be lots of opportunities to watch it again. Uh, obviously, there's some other Unixes versions missing here like Irix and so on and so forth but as you can see Unix really is a super influential OS so that was a pretty fun thing to do all right so now for something completely different um, at the end of last class I showed you a sample problem and um, Somebody is asking, didn't realize Solaris was that recent. So actually, so Sun OS goes back to the early 80s, right around 82. And it got rebranded as Solaris in the early 90s because the early 90s is when Sun came out with the 64-bit Spark. And they wanted to kind of rebrand the OS at that time to reflect the fact that they had this new 64-bit architecture. Sorry if I seem overly excited about Sun. I worked there. Sun people like Sun. It's a strange thing. Uh, all right. So something completely different. We were looking at, as I mentioned, a sample problem. If you're looking on Piazza, this is Q transfer. And what it's saying is that suppose that you have a multi-threaded program and there are N global queues or N queues on a heap. And you want to support an operation for transferring data from one queue to another. How would you provide the synchronization for this? And how would you make sure that you have no deadlocks? Now, when you're given a problem like this, you're going to look at this and you're like, okay, so I need a global lock. So if I have just a regular global lock, uh, that would work technically, but, and, and I'll show you how you would do that. So let's just draw here. So we'd have our transfer function. And I'm going to short form some things just for simplicity's sake. So we've got QA and we've got QB. And if we had just one global lock, then of course we acquire, sorry, A is not the name of the lock. Let's just call it LK. We do our transfer and then we would release our lock. And then of course, every single operation that works on these queues would have to acquire this global lock, this one shared lock and release it at the end of the operation. Okay, technically speaking, this does work. But there's a problem with this. If we do it in this way, then there's no point in having multiple threads at all because every single one of these uh, functions is going to have to require and release this one shared lock. And the problem with that is then effectively, even if multiple threads are trying to execute operations on these queues at the same time, the threads are going to have to wait for the one lock. So you might as well have just gotten rid of the threads. So technically this does all the things that we wanted. It prevents race conditions and it, there's no deadlock, but we also have stripped the program back down to being essentially a single thread of the world. And that's not what we want. And if we had a real final exam, I mean, you have a quiz on learn, but it's like multiple choice and so on. Um, but if we were writing a real sit down final where you had to write a solution to this particular problem, this solution here would not get you many marks. So what solutions could be better? Well, let's take a look. One thing that you could do uh, is consider the fact that you have N queues and you want the ability to do transfers between those queues at the same time. So what if instead of having one lock, what if we have one lock, I'll write it down here. 
one lock per Q. And then the idea is that in order to perform a transfer, you have to acquire the lock for QA and the lock for QB. Now that has a lot of ad advantages, of course, because you could then run transfer on Q1 and Q2 at the same time as transfer on Q3 and Q4 and so on and so on. And in fact, when you have one lock per Q, you can get a maximum number of threads as N over two running at the same time. So that's going to be the maximum number of threads that can execute at the same time, which is really, really great. So how would you actually solve this? Because now that you're having to acquire multiple resources, you're going to end up with the problem of a race condition. Now, if you remember, we showed you two different ways last class to actually address race conditions. One of those, of course, was to use no hold and wait. So if we use no hold and wait, what we're going to do is we will acquire lock A, and then while we are not able to acquire the lock for the second Q, which is lock B, we will release A. Now it's always actually a reasonable idea to put a thread yield here. Uh, you don't have to, but encouraging a context which at this point isn't a bad idea. Uh, and then we're going to acquire lock A again. Remember with no hold and wait, the whole thing is that you're not allowed to spin or block while you own any resource. So trying to acquire lock B while you own lock A isn't permitted. So that's why we have to release and then reacquire A. Once you reach this point here, you own A and B. So that's one option that you have. And that's fairly straightforward. But of course, in order to implement no hold and wait solution, you're going to need to have an actual implementation of try acquire, which for the record for assignment one and for this course, you do not need to implement try acquire. Uh, nothing that we have actually uses it, nor would we notice. So another option that you have is to use resource ordering. Now, a mistake that people make with resource ordering in this function is that they assume that this is the lower resource number. And I want to tell you that is not an assumption that you can make. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to figure out whether A's Q or B's Q lock has the lower order or the lower number. So we're going to check. Let's assume that we can check uh, if Q, well, let's say A dot. We're going to say num is the resource number is less than B's resource number, then you're going to acquire A, and then you acquire B. Otherwise, you're going to acquire them B and then A. Like so. Sorry, that should be lock A and lock B. So that's how we would do it with resource ordering. Now this probably doesn't look like too bad of a piece of code, but if you think about it, if you've got say 10 arguments, well, that sort of becomes a problem because now you've actually got to sort those 10 arguments according to the resource number before you actually acquire all the locks. It's not to say that it's bad, it's just that 
keep in mind whether you're using no hold and wait strategy or you're using the resource ordering strategy, there's going to be a little bit of work involved, especially as the number of resources grows, which is why there are actually other algorithms that are used for deadlock prevention uh, in the real world. Uh, such as Banker's Algorithm. And if memory serves me, if you take CS343, which I highly recommend, uh, you'll learn more about deadlock prevention strategies there. And a lot of other really fun stuff. All right. So with that, uh, I don't really want to start a new topic today. Uh, the next topic we're going to be discussing is processes but just a little bit of remaining advice for assignment one. Um, I know a lot of you are going to be spending a lot of time trying to get the traffic problem solved within that very small time frame that we have specified. And if you're not quite sure where the formulas are coming from, if you go to the course website under A1 Hints, you'll actually see the formulas. And first off, I wanna say we have an epsilon value that is we're not really sharing it with you, but what the epsilon is, but it's a very generous epsilon. So if one or two of your instances is going above by just a little bit, you should be fine. Um, the other thing I want to say is it's going to be very tempting to spend a lot of time trying to get it just perfect so you can get every last mark. And I want to tell you, it's almost not worth the effort. Um, get a solution working. And yes, it's worth marks, obviously, but it's more because the traffic simulation problem is not actually a part of an operating system in the real world. This is really just an exercise in can you see some different ways of using things like locks and condition variables. If you don't have this working for assignment A to A, it doesn't matter because we're never going to retest the traffic simulation problem for the rest of the course after assignment one. So it's certainly not worth spending slip days on, in my opinion. And again, just to reiterate, assignment A to A, that is one that you're going to want to save your slip days for because as I've mentioned before, it's not the implementation that's difficult for A to A, it's actually the debugging for A to A that's quite difficult. Now, on the notes of debugging for A1, if you're seeing a panic that is kind of invisible, so you start OS 161 and then it immediately quits, then you probably have a problem with your lock implementation. And my recommendation to you is if you're running into this problem, is it's probably something to do with create or destroy, most likely create. Um, maybe you haven't initialized something correctly like held or owner, or maybe your lock do I hold doesn't work correctly. That's typically where I see the problems coming from in a lock implementation. My recommendation is to take for lock create and lock destroy, take sem create and sem destroy and copy and paste the code and then make the teeny modifications to it. There's no reason that you need to write that from scratch. And don't worry about things like moss. We are aware that we are telling you to do this. I mean, the assignment spec, if you read it carefully, even suggests it. So you're not going to be uh, marked for cheating if everybody copies some create into lock create. That's totally fine. Uh, the other thing I want to say is make sure inside of lock acquire and lock release that you're testing held and setting held appropriately. And if you're one of those individuals who's decided to combine held and owner into a single variable, which by the way, it is possible, uh, again, make sure that you are initializing and resetting it as appropriate. Uh, it's really common for people to either forget to set it uh, initially, or it's common for people to forget to reset it and release such that when locks in the operating system actually try to do their thing, uh, it can't actually try to acquire it. Ooh, looks like I'm getting a parcel. Yay. <laughs> All right. So on next week's episode, we are going to start discussing the next module of the course, which is going to be processes. This is actually a very short module, so we will be completely done all of the content you need for A2A and A2B at the end of next week, which is kind of cool. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that the synchronization quiz is now live on Learn, 
and I apologize for the delay. So with that, special thanks again to our guest, Dr. Brian Kernahan, and I will see you all next week. Thank you.